um, Lee Madison's excellent contribution. Matt Truck was due to appear next, but unfortunately he's rather ill at the moment. But he did send uh, an email touching on his best wishes to all of us for a successful day the event. Now at which point can I now call upon Paul Mackney, the previous president of the Birmingham Trades Council, the previous general secretary of the UCU, and from 1997 to 2007, the previous president of the Birmingham Trades Council from 1983 to 4. Can I call upon Paul Mackney?
I was told at the first meeting, it may have been by that doorman, that six Lord Mayors had come from the Trades Council in the first hundred years. <laughs> Sir David Perris himself, who was the secretary in the 60s and 70s, and incidentally I tried to visit him before this meeting to see if he had anything to say, and unfortunately he's now um, uh, with dementia in a, uh, an old folks' home, so the oral history people are too late to get anything out of David. But um, <coughs> he held a number of positions. He had offices at the top of Corporation Street, he was Secretary of Trades Council and the Regional TUC, Chair of the West Midlands County Association of Trades Councils, an organisation I could humour you with the detail of on another occasion. He sat on the bench in the courts nearby. He was Chair of the uh, uh, Birmingham Magistrates Association, and he was also Chair of the West Midlands Regional <coughs> Health Authority based in Steelhouse Lane. He'd organised the <coughs> Uh, a fairly powerful position around uh, Steel House Lane um, Corporation Street, but he's in some ways he epitomised what people were expected to try and do. And every year we got a handbook with four pages of positions held by different people. Um, I was told by a good comrades like Mar uh, Mary here uh, that Birmingham Trades Council ought to be a workers' parliament. And it was a good place to learn and develop your speaking skills. In fact, the first person um, I heard speak, and I made a note of this, got so carried away with his oratory, he said, "Brothers and sisters, are we just going to uh, we just going to sit here and take this lying down?" <laughs> Never forgotten that phrase. The, the general secretary's phrase is, uh, "What do we do, comrades, when our backs are against the wall?" turn around and start fighting. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> I chatted to delegates. I chatted to delegates. It's like town. Yeah. I, got the, I got the door person to do the door steward. And I, the, on the basis probably of chatting to people, I got an executive. I was elected vice president in a process which will be mentioned in a minute. Then president for four years. And in my union through Birmingham Secretary Regional Commission, <laughs> and then eventually elected General Secretary. Had I not had a heart attack, I was going to say this to Matt today, and had to uh, give up, I would actually, by a process known as Buggins' turn on the TUC <laughs> Council, I would actually be president of the TUC this year. All of that actually came, goes back to that first meeting and Mary telling me it was an important thing to do and I needed to serve time on the door. <laughs> anyway, going back in history, foundation of Birmingham Trades Council. First of all, Birmingham Trades Union long before it even had a town council. Uh, I just picked one example in February 1777, so before the first fleet went to Australia, tailors down tools against a 25% cut in prices. But the key date for our current purposes is the 22nd of May, 1986, when 25 delegates from skilled craft unions met in Tamworth Arms on Moore Street to establish a trades council. I don't think Tamworth Arms is there anymore. I suspect there is a building there, and it's high time we had a plaque. Uh, by 1950, average attendance had peaked at over 200 delegates, so as Mary has said, there were still some meetings later of that number. The first secretary was from the Carpenters and Joiners Union, and he'd just been involved in a four-month strike against something called the discharge note, which meant when you finished on one job, you had to be signed up as a decent and honorable worker before you could get another job, which in other words, it's a kind of self-blacklisting process, and they've gone on strike against it. Um, in, uh, February of that year, a trade unionist involved in dispute, William Carroll's the name, had been jailed for six months under the Masters and Servants Act. Uh, for contemporary times, it's worth noting that in that year, a major bank, uh, which we don't remember the name of these days, but it was Overend and Gurney's, collapsed. And uh, for those who enjoy the more spectacular side of trade unionism, there were also the Sheffield outrages, 
when a scab had some gunpowder pushed down his chimney into the fireplace uh, with a consequence explosion. As um, comrades up the road will tell you, BTUC was established one year after Wolverhampton Trades Council, uh, but two years before the foundation of the TUC, which was in 1968. Wolverhampton 67, TUC was 68. Indeed, the second conference of the TUC was hosted here at the Odd Fellows Hall in Upper Temple Street in 1869. We made this a point to Ken Graham, a TUC official, who was sent up to tell us that in about 1982 that we weren't an important enough body to accept money from the county council to set up a trade union resource centre and a centre for the unemployed. And I think it was Mick Rice who said to him, look, we were <coughs> two years before you were, we'll take money from wherever we think it's appropriate to take money from. Corbett, in a, one of his summaries of uh, what's happened, and I'm going to look at aspects of it, said the Trades Council, while it has had a century of continuous existence, has had to modify its policy and activity to meet the disparate challenges it has to face. Mm. Its one constant has been change. It has been most successful when it's recognized the new needs and searched for ways to resolve them. I was particularly pleased to see the momentum still on the mm -hmm. Because some of the way in which people have been galvanized by momentum, we've something to learn from it. I'm not going to go through them in detail, but the historians will tell you, you can see waves of prosperity followed by periods of trade uh, depressions, which have affected the different stages of um, response. So you've had responses, for those who know the jargon, Owenism, Chartism, um, New Unionism, Christian Socialism, different approaches. Uh, and in the 1990s, of course, I don't think it affected Birmingham Trades Council too much, New Realism. <laughs> and we're probably just in a phase of community unionism or something like it. Um, but it's worth remembering that in the last 50 years, the number of industrial jobs in the UK has fallen from almost 9 million to almost 3 million. That's what we have to adjust our minds to, those of us who grew up on a nine million. Also throughout that period, and I won't go through all the examples, but there have been struggle against anti-union laws, which have come and gone. Combinations Acts, Masters and Servants, Thatcher's Laws, Trade Union Act, after the general strike with the repressive Trade Disputes Act and so on. <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not in great voice today. From its inception, Birmingham Trades Council had a strong supporting role for disputes. One of the most exciting periods, uh, which is in, related in this book, in fact, it's so good that George Barnsby, his book on Birmingham Working People, has more or less lifted word for word, uh, I noticed, from <laughs> the book. The, the period was 1909 to 1914, mm -hmm. when neo-syndicalist ideas affected things here. There were names that may not mean much to you, but I'll mention a couple of them. J. E. Berry, Jack Beard, Joseph Kesterton, and Julia Farley, who were in control of the executive, and they went out organizing their employ and a demand if the demand wasn't agreed to get the people to go on strike. Went all over the, the West Country, uh, Birmingham went, and the Black Country too. It was high octave trade unionism as well. Um, in 1911, troops in the form of the Munster Fusiliers were used in Birmingham against mass railway strikes. I'd forgotten that. We all talk, those who have a bit of knowledge of history remember Tommy Pandy and the troops sent in by Churchill. Well, they were sent in round here uh, 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 as, as well. One delegate, and there's always one in the Trades Council, uh, whose name was H.J. Sabin, tried to excuse this military intrusion at the next General Council, saying, well, we have to realize that this was probably necessary for maintaining food supplies 
He was contemptuously rounded on by Jack Beard, who was one of that sort of syndicalist quartet I mentioned, who said the rights of workers have been won by men who took the, the risks in their own hands and were ready to be hanged at the gallows for the cause. <laughs> anyway, at the next meeting, there was some concern that the government was now planning to make picketing illegal. And the hapless H.J. Sabin got up again and made another intervention, calling for the Trades Council to endorse respectable picketing. <laughs> <laughs> and it drew a scornful repost from Julia Barley, about whom more later, who said that after her experience in black country strike, the only peaceful picketing she cared for was with a brick. <laughs> <laughs> According to the, the Trade Council minutes for January 1912, in the next executive committee elections, Julia Barley polled 99 votes, H.J. Sobin, Sabin, 11 votes. <laughs> Excuse me one minute. You should probably clap Julia Barley on. Yeah. <laughs> In many ways, a big period for organising, winning disputes and mass involvement. I mean, there are lots of examples of people getting white. A BSA, British Small Arms, is that what it's BSA? <laughs> uh, works in 1911. 3,500 walked out, uh, marched from Golden Hillock Road to a demo of 8,000 people in the ball ring. In 1918, it's a sort of flow on from this period. It was a strike by a policeman for Birmingham. Mm. I bet you didn't know that. Yeah, didn't know that. Unfortunately, they didn't organise it very well, and all those who went on strike were victimised. But mm. they, congratulations to them for the effort. And in that period, you've got the three big general unions which set the tone for our period TMG, AEU, GNWU. But in um, 1923, a National Federation of Trades Councils was formed at a conference, guess where it was held? Birmingham, mm -hmm. again, in the centre. The period of activity culminated in the general strike, which really you need a meeting of its own on it. But general strike started with a march of 25,000 people through Birmingham, with 100,000 lining the street. Mm -hmm. They had a central committee, a central council of action, an emergency committee, every area had a strike committee. Uh, lorries and cars didn't move unless they had permits from the permits committee. There was a strike bulletin uh, edited by someone who later became famous, John Strachey. Uh, they ran courier networks from London and the Midlands. After a few days, some communist activists were arrested. And then on the 12th of May, 20 of the emergency committee were arrested. Then came the unbelievable news that the TUC nationally had capitulated mm -hmm. and large, wide-scale victimization of activists in what was a selective return to work. <coughs> the Trades Council then devoted its energies for the rest of the year to feeding the miners' families because the miners continued on until mm -hmm. November. Do you want me to carry on with this sort of... Yeah, yeah. 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 In the last 50 years, we've seen more than three minor strikes. Mm -hmm. In 1972, which ended in the victory at Salty Gate, mm -hmm. when however many it is, 10, 15,000 engineers marched to close the gas depot in support of the pickets. Um, when I was um, head of the Birmingham Trade Union Study Center in wherever Dick was now, um, we had a mural painted and it had uh, the toilets in front of the gate with Arthur Harper, who was the convener at Tractor and Transmissions, and the other Arthur, Arthur Scargill, standing on the toilet directing uh, <laughs> operations. <laughs> and the police yeah. put in the lock on the gate, yeah. and the police horse walked off <laughs> like this. <laughs> the road. That mural still exists in pieces somewhere in, in the college and needs to be mm. taken out and put up again, even yeah. standing on this mm. wall here. Mm. Um, so I lost his face then. Um, then we had the miners' strike, which brought down the Heath government. I was working in Germany at the time. I didn't get back in time for the victory. Um, then 1984, 85, 
and it's documented in here. I noticed this, however, is selling at 30 quid in some places on the internet. It only cost five quid originally, but if you keep looking, you'll probably get one. Birmingham and the Miner Strike. I must admit, I had a hand in. Um, the, uh, you had food collections, factory collections, songs, busking initiated by Banner Theatre, picketing, leafleting, cat and mouse battles with the police, occupation of the sequestrators, price oil, warehouse, offices. There were links with struggles, for example, Key World's um, factory in Answorth. Uh, people put up miners for the whole year. We, we, our house stank of chips and fruit for a year. <laughs> um, social events, visits to mining communities and events with women against pit closures. Just mentioning past near the late Jill Smith, who was a lollipop lady in King's Heat, who by the end of the year had this sort of uh, it was about, about this size, full of badges, it's in the museum which was, there. I was going to say, it's now, in the, it's now in the museum, that's right, I might have forgotten it. Yeah. <laughs> um, <coughs> uh, and she was symptomatic of how some areas, ordinary people, got involved. Um, <laughs> we used to go collecting like this uh, yeah. in, on, on Saturdays in the centre. We pull these out about right. four o'clock as Chief Inspector Postman from the notebook to make a note of the songs we were singing. And um, uh, we'd sing in the Laughing Policeman, but the version that's in the back of the year, not the one you, you may have heard of, children's favourites. And. Um, Oh, I'll have a little reminisce on that. At the end of the strike, um, I, the next year there was, a, there was a march for the victimized miners and I went down to register the route with the police. And um, I went in there and I said, well, how's Chief Inspector Hoskins getting on? And they said, he, he really <laughs> hated you. I said, but we used to sing him songs every time. <laughs> What, we used to entertain him, what's the, what's the matter? He said, look, you went home about half past five. He would then come down Steel House Lane and start writing his report where he wrote down as much as he could remember of what you've been seeing. <laughs> <laughs> so somewhere in Steel House Lane <laughs> is a hidden cache of sheer poetry, yeah. <laughs> which uh, I hope someone will discover one day. Um, but there's more about that. You'll get that from Banner later, I expect. Um, but Trades Council supported, I just jotted down some, almost every other group of workers in struggle. Um, Grumwick workers, postal workers, teachers, ambulance workers, steel workers, Liverpool dockers, and printers in uh, the Sun and News of the World chapel. It's worth noting, in saying that in the first hundred years, for 49 of the first 100 years of Trades Council, there was either a, 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 there was a printing worker, either secretary or president, and for 17 of them, they held both positions. Uh, there's, I've got a whole chunk here on politics, which I shall truncate, because the Labour stuff is quite complicated. Uh, it's worth noting that while and you know, there was a split in World War I and so on, and it was called Trades and Labour Council for a bit. It's worth noting that while other socialist groups from Social Democratic Federation to SWP and others were often active apart from the Labour Party, there were also periods of strong anti-communism, starting with the exclusion of the CP Communist, Communist Party from the May Day Committee in 1929 and through the early 30s, and again in the early 50s with McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. Though there were CP members on the executive throughout the 50s, um, it partly explains why there was actually little involvement by the Trade Council with the hunger marches, which were organized by <coughs> CP-led national unemployed workers movement. The Red Scares put a number of trade councils on. It's not true when people say, oh, we organized our the marches and everyone got the I mean, even the Jarrow marches uh, were, were, were supported everywhere. Um, 
They also used to have, uh, until the early 60s, some of the marches, if they were organized, would uh, have a little man who would carry a placard. Does anyone know what it said at the end of the march? And it would say, the official march ends here. <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes think it'd be a good idea to bring it back. <laughs> and then behind the person with the placard, there'd be various far left forces and various eccentrics. Uh, uh, they parade along. Anyway, redemption, to be fair to the Trades Council, came in the early 60s and there was a witch hunt because the Trades Council, which had always had a seat on the Education Committee since 1902, it put forward Alex McCullough, who was loved by me and Mary and probably others here, um, to, to be our representative on the Education Committee. And the Evening Mail, or Meaning Evil, as we used to call it, uh, ran a sort of campaign saying there shouldn't be a communist indoctrinating people from the Education Committee. Anyway, the, the Trades Council stood its ground and Alec was accepted onto the committee. Uh, I don't know if the Trades Council still has someone on the education yeah. 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 No. Probably not. Um, it's going to be have to, have to go quicker. Uh, the the uh, another story from uh, in this area. There was for one year a um, uh, Socialist Workers Party vice chair called um, God, what was his name? Keith Cargill. Oh, and, no. uh, he chaired one meeting. And he banged the gavel so hard that Alec apparently had to go and get a new hearing aid. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, trade council and racism. It doesn't appear to have succumbed to the sort of racism that affected some other trade union bodies in the 50s and 60s. 1954, they welcomed the employment of black workers on the buses. You'll remember in the 60s, they were still opposing that in cities like, like Bristol. Uh, the minutes say trade unionists of this country have long ago declared their opposition to discrimination by fellow race or creed. Apologise or withdraw his remark. And at the next election, he was replaced by Maurice Ludman, the founding editor of Searchlight Magazine. And uh, I came in, I can see it, so I know. I'll do the best. Uh, I came in, I uh, was dragged in as vice. President, and sadly, Morris died shortly after. I need to go to the <coughs> island. Um, Trades Council affiliated to the first International Working Men's Association, the second international, and um, between, uh, I've lost it now, sorry. We were discouraged, however, from uh, international <laughs> In the late 1970s, and I've got the quote here, but I'll jump in. Brendan Barber wrote to us regarding Ireland, mm. um, saying that we should limit ourselves to domestic and not international matters. Since our motion had been on Northern Ireland, that was yeah. some amusement. <laughs> <laughs> Northern Ireland was at the time part of the UK and not strictly speaking an international matter. No. And though a number of delegates would like to to make it an international yeah. matter of having a united island. His, his left, anyway, his letter fell on, uh, on, on yeah, years. years. Um, you can find all the major disputes, you can find an involvement. The Dublin lockout, mm -hmm. which led to 12 railway workers being sacked down here and mass walkouts uh, by people in support of them. And mm -hmm. some people here may remember when the Trades Council the secretary and the president, I was the president then. There. I must mention the women workers bit, otherwise I'll be in trouble for them. Um, representation of women on Birmingham TUC within the first hundred years was very poor. Um, the main principal figure is Julia Varley, who arrived in Birmingham from Bradford in 1909. She was the first woman member of Birmingham Trades Council executive, sorry. Uh, and um, she worked initially with the National Federation with Women Workers. She helped organize Cadbury Women Workers, that was her branch, and was involved in the crazy train makers, chain makers dispute. She was described by one of the delegates as a pocket dreadnought. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what a dreadnought is, that's a battleship. Um, 
and she pops up everywhere. You read something, oh, there's Julia Barley again speaking at the Labour Sunday School in Sturchley or something. Um, noticeably, Trade Council in the discussion on social insurance argued for equal benefits and maternity pay, which must have been quite early to the demand. She moved to the workers' union since then, uh, there were, there were a couple of long-serving treasurers who, who were women, but there were, as I said, only three or four. John Corbyn commented on this in his book, saying this aspect of council's activity still is weak. He then commended one attempt to overcome this deficit, but I'm not sure that it would meet with approval today. On May the 14th, 1958, the Trades Council Women's Advisory Committee organized a fashion parade <laughs> and brains trust at the Birmingham Institute with 750 people in attendance. Well, the, as Mary said, there were only four women delegates when I joined the Trades Council. One who's worthy of mention, Josie Ashby, uh, was the sort of longest serving probably of those. The first president, who was a woman, was Geraldine Egan, who succeeded me, though there was backed up after that, but we shouldn't forget also the people who worked in the office, Veronica Melhardo and Lynn Linley through that period. Okay, I'm almost done. Um, <laughs> Why use I a have, sentence when a paragraph I haven't <laughs> mentioned uh, <laughs> how in, after David, with, after we took over the offices, you've got another phase. Uh, some people called us the Young Turks for a while because we set up trade union resource centre, unemployment workers centre. Is that still going? No. Mm -hmm. uh, the youth employment training resource centre. There was even a disability rights watch which Geraldine used to run with Bob Finley. And there was a different approach to a, a campaigning form of unionism. Someone told me when I joined, and I'm near the end, that Trade Council was for old lags and young hotheads. Uh, I was then a young hothead, I suppose. But I'd quite like us now to find some more young hotheads. If you look at the record, the campaigning Trade Council did may have seemed like it failed, but it often paid off later. So the campaigns of the 10s and the 20s and 30s paid off in the spirit of 1945. Mm -hmm. So as William Morris said, you can fight and lose the battle, and then the thing you fight for, fought for, comes about in spite of that defeat. Mm -hmm. And when it comes out, it turns to be, it turns out to be not quite what we meant. <laughs> and, and others have to fight for what we mean under another name. I think there's room here for there ought to be, as has been suggested, a committee to take the historical side forward. That might enable me to be rather more brief. Um, I can see a role for people going around doing tape recording people for oral contributions. I can see a role for getting people to denote their papers to the Central Library Archive. There's nothing worse than becoming a coffin chaser after the person's gone. Mm -hmm. Much better to get them to get their papers in, in order, including many of us here probably. Mm -hmm. Talk to your boring elderly relatives because they've probably got tales to tell of when they worked in Birmingham factories and so on and so forth. Then we could have a BTUC trail which people could walk around the centre mm -hmm. of the trade county mm -hmm. with the MD mm -hmm. more prominent. But above all, we should celebrate Salty Gate every February. <laughs> because whereas Toll Puddle, Durham Miners, Burston, all those other events that the um, Burford where the levelers were shot, they all actually involve a defeat. Mm -hmm. The difference for us is yeah. that we won. Yes. And so, and the way you win is never give up. Thank you. Thank you.